Okay, welcome everyone uh, to this um, wonderful Mary Ward House for a day to talk about sustainable living, myths, meanings, and realities. It's a, it's a great pleasure to, to welcome you here. The, the aim of the day is to present to you some of the work that the Sustainable Lifestyles Research Group has been undertaking over the last three and a half to four years. When I think back, actually, to the to the origins of the Sustainable Lifestyles Research Group. It's like thinking back into, into the past. The past is another country, says the eponymous narrator in the 1970s film, The Go-Between. And, and nothing could be further than from the truth when we, when we think back at the high ambitions for sustainability that existed only a decade ago in this very country. And um, I'm not suggesting at all, of course, that it's anything other than high ambitions now, but things have certainly changed for some very powerful reasons. And that is a theme in uh, some of our work. But the idea for a, a center of excellence in the UK looking at sustainable behaviors was originally the brainchild of one Jill Rutter, who was director of strategy and sustainable development at DEFRA in the, the mid-2000s at the time at which the UK launched its um, sustainable development strategy um, and spoke for the first time, I think, of, from, from a position of government almost uniquely amongst developed nations about issues of consumption and lifestyle. And it therefore made sense for the government to want to sponsor or part sponsor a center of excellence on, on the ideas of behaviors, lifestyles, and consumption. They got together with the ESRC and the Scottish government. They all put some money into the pot. And at that stage, of course, academic competition being what it is, we found ourselves in competition with another very strong bid from Manchester. And at the point at which the decision had to be made, which bid to choose, the funders very uh, equanimously decided to split the funding and our wonderful program which would have solved all the problems and given everybody all the answers had to be cut down drastically to the projects that you will hear described to you today and I like to think that what we ended up with was a deceptively spacious portfolio of related projects around a cluster of themes one of the themes is the processes of change that people, institutions, households, and communities go through. Another theme is the theme of community itself, the role of civil society in promoting sustainability. The third theme is around economics. And we have a set of projects which address some of the economics issues of sustainable living. And then a final theme, which we will come to later in the day around synthesis, synthesizing policy insights, synthesizing some of the cross-cutting messages of a diverse portfolio of research. That is the smorgasbord that awaits you throughout today. Um, my hope is that it will be uh, informative, interactive, exciting, that we've put enough time in there for you to raise questions. Please do raise your hands and shout if you feel that we haven't at any point and that you have a burning issue that you would like to interrupt proceedings with. That's perfectly appropriate. And I say that for all the speeches, of course, except my own at the end. Um, and please do feel free to talk to us at the breaks in the middle, to network, to come up to us. At the end of the day, we have a panel discussion in which hopefully everybody will be involved and will be able to uh, probe, to test, to query, to think about the future, and to wonder what on earth could be left to answer once SLRG's presentations have all been made clear to you. I want to give the floor very briefly, before we start, to um, Zoe Donkin, who uh, is here representing DEFRA. DEFRA has been our majority funder. They've been incredibly supportive from the very beginning. I remember distinctly those questions where we sat down and had to make hard choices about which projects we had to get rid of and I'm not at all resentful of the ones that we had to get rid of. Um, in particular, the one about economic stability, which I, of course, um, is dear to my heart. 
um, and I will return to at some point later in the day, but DEFRA's support has been important uh, and integral to the work that we've carried out over the last years. And, and Zoe in particular, and Lee um, also, Lee Davis who's here as well, have been robust testers of our ideas, turning up at meeting after meeting and saying, you have to answer the policy question, so what? And hopefully, we've done a little bit of that, and I'm sure they will tell us if we haven't. Zoe, let me give the floor very briefly to you to introduce SLRG from the DEFRA perspective. Hello, everyone. So I'm Zoe Donkin, and I've been um, project manager for the SLRG for its entire duration, which I feel quite proud of, considering how much people move around in government. Um, I did have a small interlude where I went off and had a child, so I had my own moment of change halfway through the group, and I was sad that I wasn't invited to be part of the uh, moment of change project, looking into the impact of having a new baby, because I would have been able to provide some excellent insights, I'm sure. Um, so, as Tim said, SLRG is, um, has been funded by DEFRA, ESRC, and the Scottish Government, um, and we also funded the Sustainable Practices Research Group. And those two gro groups between them have provided us with a really excellent evidence base now from which we can move on and forward to think about sustainable lifestyles. I think, in many ways, um, the groups have really all been about change, about how you can create and inspire change and what happens when change occurs. And so it's fitting that the context within which the group has sat has been its itself in some kind of flux. Civil servants move around, policies change, but the important thing is that the big issues remain the same. So, really, I just wanted to say how much I'm looking forward to having my brain stimulated by today's session. It has been incredibly inspiring to be part of the journey, working closely with the academics. And I think in terms of government working effectively with academics, this has been a really excellent model for us. Um, I hope him that you haven't answered everything and that in fact we come away with quite a lot of questions as well as some answers and certainly going forward my role and Lee's role is to ensure that the group's findings really have policy impact and that we can really translate the so what to our colleagues in DEFRA and in other government departments. So thank you very much Tim and Ian for pulling the event together and bringing us all together. Uh, many thanks, Zoe. We're already, and this is entirely my fault, running slightly late, and so we'll move swiftly on to the first substance of the morning, which is a, which is a, a session dedicated to the idea of exploring transition from social and from psychological points of view. And we've got, a, we've got two presentations in this, after which we'll have a little time for questions. And I'll, I'll just ask um, Basta Planken and Kate Burningham and Sue and uh, Sue Venom, Birgitta Gattersleben to come to the stage, and um, we'll make a start. Your presentation's on here somewhere, presumably, Bass, is it? There we go, let's have a look. Okay, thank you very much, um, and uh, welcome, everybody. Um, it's really delighted, I'm delighted to see so many faces here. Um, we're going to, I'm going to talk to kick off this um, session by talking about things we all um, are very familiar with, and in essence, I'm going to talk about this, um, that most of the time, what we do is what we do most of the time. So this is the theme of, of my talk, um, and this has been also the core of uh, the project that we've been uh, doing the past three years. Now, in order to, to set the scene and to, and, to, and to be on the same page with you, um, I first will briefly introduce the concept of habit. And when we think about habits, we, we usually think about um, 
obviously things we do um, very much a lot of the time. And think about commuting, um, for instance, as, in, as in one of the key behaviors that we, uh, we are very concerned about. Um, we, we do that every day and very much, very often, the same way, the same time, uh, and the, the, same, the same route. So whatever commuting kind of um, uh, mode of transport you use, whether you use the car, whether you're cycling, or whether you use any other transportation mode, for instance, dog sleighs, it's, it's the same thing every day. So in order to set the scene, let's talk very briefly about the concept of habit. And as I said, one of the key uh, pillars of habit is that habits are repetitive behaviors. It's important still to realize that, although it's, it's common sense, um, because the, the repetitive element makes habits um, very important in terms of their cumulative effects. It's not, not a problem if you drive around uh, the countryside for a nice holiday, but if the whole population is driving every day to work, then you may have a problem. But very uh, less uh, uh, in, in, let's say, the, the, the common sense kind of um, uh, definition of habit is the fact that habits are automatic behaviors. We are doing things on the fly. So there's a lack of awareness and a lack of conscious intent, and that's a very important aspect of, of habits. Now maybe a third one, you could say, well, maybe not a pillar which, which is a part of the habit itself, but very much part of the, the way habits occur, and that is that habits are controlled by cues in the environment. Um, and cues can be anything. It can be the time that you, that you see on the clock and you, you know you have to, to make a decision to go uh, out and so on. Um, it, it can be all kinds of cues in the environment that trigger the behavior that we call habits. And it's important because this is the way we usually think about our behavior. We, we think that we are driven by all kinds of motives, by values, by beliefs we have about consequences, by attitudes, our intentions, and actually, to, to sum it all up, we think very much that behavior is driven by our willpower. And very much so, it might be, it might very well be, but when we talk about habits, it's actually this what happens. Cues trigger automatic responses without interference of any conscious intentions or our values or our attitudes. And this is the problem, because this is also why control of behavior is in a way delegated from our minds, from our willpower, from our intentions, to the environment where we act. So the habitual consumer is, just to, to summarize, acts on the automatic pilot, is not driven by values or attitudes, is not interested in your information, is also not likely to reconsider their habits by default. And that's very important to realize. People are not waiting for new information. People are not waiting to be persuaded to do things that they, uh, to do other things than they already do. So these are barriers for change, and we need to find ways to get around it. Our traditional ways, our traditional um, campaigns, our traditional um, ways of trying to, uh, to, to change behavior um, are very much not working when we talk about strong habits. So in our, in our project, we, we took one approach that we tested, which, which is about habit discontinuities. Um, through the course of our lives, and, and, and anyone is, is, is experiencing that in some way or another, we, we enter areas, we enter times where things change. So we move house, starting a family, we retire, your organization may change. And these changes um, usually occur in a, in a short time frame, um, before that, we have our old habits, and after that, we pick them up again. Now, our assumption in this project was that this little break might provide an opportunity for better interventions. So, the interventions um, might be more worth doing because new solutions at that moment are needed. So, suppose you move house and you have to find your way to do things again. Um, information can be more useful than in a default situation, and people might be in the mood for change. So, in effect, what we assu the assumption underlying this project is that any intervention, suppose it's, it's, it's a valid intervention, it's a well-thought intervention, might be more valuable, provide more value for money when it's delivered 
in the context or geared towards this habit, this continuity, this window of opportunity. So what we did was we embarked on a large project, a field experiment. Um, and those of you who are familiar with that, that kind of paradigm know that it's a very difficult thing to do. We, we wanted to test actually this habit discontinuity hypothesis um, in the context of moving house. And we uh, liaised with the Peterborough Environment City Trust, um, a very nice organization who, who is knocking on people's door who have moved house. And they are talking to people who moved house. They, they sort of try to find out with the inhabitants uh, where opportunities for change uh, uh, are and help them to, to achieve that. Now, we hired this organization into our project. So we built an intervention uh, together with them, a bespoke intervention for this project, which consisted of a personal interview. Um, participants get, got free sustainable items. We pro provided them with tailored information. We, we talked with them on the doorstep, and then on the basis of that, we provided them information about the kind of changes that might be feasible for them, and we provided newsletters. We looked at 25 behaviors, and they were ranging from saving energy, water conservation, waste reduction, transportation. And the design that we used was, was this. Basically, we, we started with 800 households. Um, they were uh, interviewed and tested at T1 baseline. Um, we looked at particular these 25 behaviors. We asked them, how often do you do these behaviors? Then there was an eight-week period in which some of the participants received an intervention. I'll come back to that in a minute. And then we had a post-test after eight weeks, and we ended up with 522 households who, who we could uh, keep in the, in the study. Now, the design was basically very simple. We had two groups, an intervention group and a control group. The intervention uh, participants' households, they received this intervention I just talked about, the control group were just measured two times in time. Of course, there's lots of complications about it, and I walk all over the, the intricacies and so on. But basically, we, we, we randomly assigned participants to conditions. But we also looked at their, their status in terms of how recently they had moved house. So we had recent movers, and we had non-movers. And I come to, 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 to that in a, in a minute to be more precise about that. But basically, we, we had these two groups. They were matched precisely. We, we took great care to, to make sure that the movers and non-movers um, were similar in, uh, in basic characteristics. So for instance, the type of house and so on, the socioeconomic status, um, the key elements, so that we could compare these two groups. So basically, we, we had this uh, two by two uh, design. The, the, the question we, we posed was, well, is the intervention that we designed, is that intervention more effective among the recent movers compared to the non-movers? That's the essential test that we tried to provide. Now, this is what we did. And for those who are familiar with statistics, um, this is a regression model. And I'm just walking over, I'm just, just not going into many details. What we wanted to know is whether we could predict behaviors, the frequency of behaviors at T2, the post-test, from a whole range of predictors. And as you, as you know, sustainable behaviors are, are sort of geared, are, are, are determined by a lot of factors, including demographics. But we also looked at the traditional models of behavior. So we looked at the habit strength at T1, values, environmental values in particular, their intentions, their control over their behavior, personal norms, and that whole package was used as statistic controls for the effect we were interested in, and that was the intervention, their moving status, and in particular, the interaction, so the combination of moving states and intervention. As I said, we wanted to know whether the intervention is more effective for movers compared to non-movers. This is what we actually found. So taking all this into account, and, and again, walking all, all over the, the statistical details, I'm coming back to one important one in a minute, we found this interaction. So we found actually that the moving status was important, and 
those who had moved recently were actually doing, responding better to the intervention than those who hadn't removed, uh, moved recently. We, we also wanted to know in more detail what, what, what about this window of opportunity? How recent is, um, how recent should you have moved in order to, to be more susceptible to the intervention? And what we found was that, as you can see here on the left-hand side, what, what this graph is showing, um, the horizontal line is, is no change in behavior. So we wrapped everything together, all the 25 behaviors. And this is a sort of um, big brush kind of analysis. Um, and we looked whether there was any change between the two measurements. And the only change we found was in this group, this group, which is the intervention group, which was consisting of movers who had moved in the past three months. So we, we, we looked at the other groups, those who had moved half a year, um, be, be in, within half a year and longer, and there were no statistically significant effects for those groups. So only in those groups where the moving had taken place the past three months, we saw an effect of the intervention. We also looked, and, and for those of you who are familiar with the DEFRA um, paradigms in this area, which um, actually, DEFRA has, a, has an interesting segmentation model, and I'm just not going into the details of that because of the time constraints. But DEFRA has a segmentation of the population in terms of how willing are they to act in a sustainably um, way, and how able are people to act. And the model distinguishes different kind of groups. So for instance, the positive environmentalists, those people who already do a lot of things, um, waste watchers, who, who, who might actually be interested, but, but not doing very much, concerned cons consumers, interesting um, group, and so on. So these seven segments um, are identified by the DEFRA model, and what we wanted to do is to see, well, where are our effects that we found in this study? Where are they located in terms of DEFRA's uh, segmentation model? And to, to, to make a long story short, we found that the effects, was, the effects were confined to the concerned consumers. And actually, it's an interesting group, but if you look again at the segmentation model, it's, it's a group that is, to some extent, willing to act, and to some extent, able to act. And that's an important thing to realize. These, let's say, these guys here, they are very willing and able to act, and they do a lot of things. They should be pampered, by the way. But these groups are interesting because they're willing and able, but they're not doing as much as they can do. And we found exactly that that group was the most responsive group to our intervention. So we may discuss this later. But I want to, to, to draw your attention on a couple of things, a couple of conclusions. First of all, this project provided what I call proof of, of concept. So the concept of habit discontinuity and the fact that we found a tiny little effect, it was a tiny little effect, and I'll come to that in a, in, in a second, but we found proof of the, con of the concept, and that was actually for us a uh, very positive uh, experience. So we, we, we found this window of opportunity, and in our case, in this case, this window uh, we found to be about three months after people had moved house. Now this is of course not set in stone, so, so we're not going to, to go to the, to the papers and say, the window of opportunity in habit discontinuity effects is three months, period. Because there might be all kinds of circumstances in other areas, other behaviors, where, where this, this might be longer or shorter anyway. But we found three months as, um, as this window in our study. So this might also provide opportunities to capitalize when we, we think about interventions to, to change behavior, to capitalize on people moving house. It's not easy, and, and I will just come in, uh, in a minute to, to some, some problems with that, but actually it is a viable and it is an interesting moment in, per, in people's life because moving house has to do with a lot of behaviors that, um, that we would consider as uh, interesting for the sustainability agenda. Taking it a bit further and zooming a bit out, we may also think about opportunities to investigate other life course events, and I mentioned a couple of them. Um, very interesting, we, we've done some research, for instance, on uh, organizations who moved uh, geographically to another location, and we found interesting discontinuity effects. Um, so there are opportunities 
all over the place, actually, because we, th there's a lot of change going on in our society and businesses and, and organizations and people are moving around. And I think we should, uh, we, could, we can, we have uh, opportunities to think more about getting our interventions geared towards those changes. Now, in terms of this, um, this project, we have to be very, very careful um, because we found a discontinuity effect, but the effect size was very small. We, you know, remember, we controlled for almost the whole world. We, we controlled for all the determinants that you can find in the literature. Um, and by doing that, we, we identified a tiny effect of habit discontinuity. Now, the effect size is small, so therefore, the, the danger is that this is taken on and say, well, okay, we have to roll this out all over the country and look at people who have moved house and so on and so forth. Don't do that. So no blanket rollout. What we need to do is how to think, how can we change, how can we increase the effect size of this phenomenon? That is, I think, the important question. Uh, not taking this out and say, well, this is, this is the, the solution for our intervention effectiveness. But we have to think about how can we increase effect sizes? So, for instance, focusing on well-defined local projects. For instance, new built areas. Very interesting uh, opportunities when large areas are being built and we, we hope that that is going to happen in the very near future. We hear all the time that we are not building enough, but when we build larger residential areas in, in one location, those are interesting opportunities because those are sort of confined to a, to a geog geographically uh, small location. And we can also then particularly use interventions to be delivered by professional organizations. So we worked with the Peterborough Environment City Trust, fantastic organization. They knew how to do it. They knew how to deliver the interventions. Um, they, they've, been, they've been doing that for years. So find the right people and tailor the information. The segmentation model is actually very useful, I think, in, uh, for, for, for doing that. And also, and that, that's something really important, I think, when, when you do local, um, well-defined local projects, um, there needs to be a, a process where community support is being built. And actually, what I would say, you need to, to transfer the control and the delivery and the thinking and the maintenance of, uh, of interventions to the community. And there's, there's work done by others um, uh, who, who are, who are more, in, uh, more expert than I am, but I think that's a very important thing for delivery as effective intervention. And also to maintain effects of an intervention, because there are lots of interventions which may be successful, and then they stop, and then everything reverts back to, to square one. So there are dangers when interventions are delivered by, for instance, real estate companies. So need to be, it, it might be very helpful to, to work with real estate companies, but it's not their mission to make people live more sustainably. And if you find a company who wants to do it, great. But this is a danger. Uh, central and local governments. Well, there's instability in funding. We, we know that fundings can be cut just like that, and what will go are these kind of projects, very likely. Uh, and so it's very, very uh, important to, to realize that. And this, the voluntary sector, great. There's fantastic work being done, but there's high turnover rates, and the, the stability of, uh, of those um, interventions might, might be a problem. So this is what I want to say, and thank you very much. I think I kept the time. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Bas, very much. Um, we're going to move straight on to the next presentation, which is covers similar subject matter. Bas, maybe stay up here on stage. Um, does, just while we're moving presentations, are there any points of clarification, immediate questions? Yes, for, for Bas. A suggestion, really, then, to consider in terms of increasing effect sizes. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, companies are, are actually engaged in this, and that's, that's I think, a very thing, uh, important thing. Yes. Yes. 
Fresh in the sun here. Um, we knocked on 8,000 doors. Um, but having said that, um, lots of those doors didn't open because people weren't at home. Uh, people are usually not at home. That's also one thing we found out. So, so the, 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 the group that was doing this intervention, all, we switched also a lot to, to, to evening and weekend uh, uh, work and so on, and that, that improved the, the, the response. But the response rate was good. Um, once we talked to people, about half of them participated. I mean, that, so, so once we really got to talk to them, um, the, 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 the response rate was actually uh, more than, than I would expect. So Okay, um, we'll have a little bit, we'll have more time for more questions um, a little bit later on, but I want us to put these two presentations together because they cover very similar subject matter, although from a, a different perspective. So the second of our presentations, the second of our projects is the illicit project, Exploring Lifestyle Changes in Transition, and here to talk about that um, is Kate Burningham. Kate. Thank you. Um, I just want to start by saying it's been very much a team effort, and particularly to mention Sue Venn, who's been the researcher on the project and has really done the bulk of the work, and I hope is going to answer the bulk of the questions, um, and Birgitta, who's going to pop up towards the end of the presentation and talk about some of the quantitative data which we collected. Okay, so I'll start just by outlining um, the aims and methodology. And in contrast to Baz's study, um, this is a qualitative exploratory project following people through the two transitions of having a first child and retiring and just looking at how various aspects of everyday life that have implications for sustainability change or remain stable as they move through those transitions. Um, I'm going to concentrate the bulk of my talk today on thinking about the experience of those transitions um, as I think this provides a kind of really useful, qualitative, critical background for thinking about uh, these transitions as potential opportunities for interventions to encourage changes uh, in behaviour. We also talk to people about their understanding of sustainable lifestyles, so we're going to talk a little bit about that, and Birgitta will present some of the quantitative data on reported changes um, in lifestyle um, and everyday behaviour. Okay, so Baz has already talked about the kind of idea that these transition points uh, within people's lives might serve as kind of good opportunities um, to intervene in areas of life which have implications for um, sustainability. And clearly the, having a child and retiring are points at which aspects of everyday life such as travel, energy use and purchase of consumer goods, we might expect those things to change in various ways. But most studies of interventions um, over these kind of transitions don't typically track individuals over time. Baz's study, for example, was is just a kind of two-point study. And where there are longitudinal studies of, uh, of the journey, to mo journey through motherhood, if you like, or through retirement, they, they don't have an eye on sustainability implications. So we wanted to look at these two key transitions and explore how various aspects of everyday life shifted um, as people went through those transitions and how they understood and explained those changes. We didn't focus on one particular practice like driving or washing, for example, but instead we were interested in the range of things that people did uh, <coughs> in an ordinary day and also their ideas about how they wanted to live and their aspirations for change. And while we were interested in <coughs> sustainable lifestyles, I mean, we're part of the Sustainable Lifestyles Research Group, we deliberately didn't recruit people to a project about how their lifestyle might change in more or less sustainable ways. We just recruited them to a project about how everyday life changed, um, and we didn't ask them questions about sustainability until the very end of the process. Um, and while we kind of kept an eye on um, points of it, potential points of intervention. We weren't kind of looking to provide interventions in the way that Baz's study was. So what did we do? <coughs> we carried out a longitudinal study, three phases of research in four locations in the UK. So in South London, in um, uh, accessible rural Scotland in Fife, in Kent and in Lancaster and Morecambe in a northern context. Um, and in each place, we recruited 10 people who were about to become parents and 10 people who were about to retire. 
Um, we wanted to get, at the beginning of the study, we hoped to get both men and women who were about to become parents, but the reality of the recruitment was that, in fact, we got an overwhelmingly female sample. So I'll talk about becoming a mother rather than becoming a parent, because that's really what we have data on. So we carried out three interviews at a period of about, about eight month intervals. Sometimes it was up to ten months between the interviews. So the first interview was before people had had their baby or before they'd retired. The second one was eight to ten months after that, and the third one was, again, the same amount of time. And we focused on talking through the, the detail of an ordinary day in terms of what was important to them and what they did at home, at issues around food purchasing consumption, modes of transport, and leisure activities. And at the end of that process, after the first and second interview, they, they, they filled in for us a seven-day reflective journal in which they kept details of what they'd done every day and also their feelings about their activities. And then before the next interview, we sent that journal back to them and it proved a really useful prompt for them to think about what was the same and what had changed um, in the period. And then we also carried out a, uh, used a lifestyle and values questionnaire at the, at, after the first interview and after the final interview, which has given us some quantitative data on changes in reported um, behaviours. So the first kind of um, thing I want to say before I talk in detail about some of our observations is that I'm going to generalise across the data today for the, for the purposes of the presentation. Um, but obviously retiring and having a, a baby are really different experiences. And even within our groups of participants, there's a tremendous amount of heterogeneity, which I won't be able to do justice to today. But that isn't to say that that's not really important. Baz already used the language of moments of change, and Zoe used the language of moments of change earlier, and it's a very kind of catchy shorthand for thinking about the opportunities that there might be at these transitions. But the first important point I want to make is these aren't moments of change. Transitions are processes in which there are multiple moments of change. And if we think, for example, about becoming a mother, it was very, we, we'd kind of set up the study thinking we're going to get to people before they go through this transition, you talk to pregnant women, they're already talking to you about a whole host of changes, not just bodily changes, but changes in what they're eating, changes in their leisure patterns, changes in their social networks. The change begins at that point, and it's not even a simple process of becoming a mother, but becoming a mother to a newborn baby, becoming used to being a mother to a toddler, becoming used to being a mother to a school-aged child and working at the same time. And routines and everyday practices with concomitant impacts to the environment kind of ch continue to change. So we don't want to say that this is not a moment of change, but it's more of a kind of fluid process in which there are multiple moments of change. Um, and any changes that we do see occurring may well be transitory. And the, the quote here is from one of the mothers who was reflecting on transport use, and she talked about how during maternity leave she used her car a lot less, she wasn't driving to work, she was enjoying walking in the locality, engaging in local groups, taking her baby out in a buggy, but once she returned to work, she was driving more than she had at the first point because she was driving her baby to childminder as well and was, had dropped out of local networks and was driving to see family and friends at weekends. The second point um, is, is about focusing on individual transitions. We decided we'd focus on having a child and retiring, two nice, distinct transitions. But what you quite quickly find is that when you talk to people, they're undergoing a whole host of other changes as well. And it's difficult to disentangle the effects of one transition from the effects of other transitions. So for example, um, th things might happen at the same time, or one major change might set up off a cascade of further changes in people's lives. And we've got here a list of, of the kind of other changes which people were kind of coming to terms with um, or shifting their life in alignment with as we went through the process. So obviously retirees have got changes in job status, but also uh, women who have children, they stop working, they might go to work, back to work part-time, they might lose their job, some of them went to different jobs. Health changes for both groups were experienced as something which, which shifted various things that they did every day. Moving house, nine of the women in our study moved during the process of the, um, of, of the research, four of them because their relationships broke up. Again, another kind of major change which has aspects for household economies and all sorts of other things. Fluctuating household composition, many of our retirees had adult children moving back in with them. So there's a whole range of other things going on 
Um, and the kind of key point we want to make about this is that it's difficult to disentangle the effects of these multiple transitions and to isolate the effect and experience of one particular transition on any changes that we might observe. Um, thirdly, we talk about transitions as though these are kind of individual, uh, individual experiences, kind of points at which an individual might change what they do, but I think it m makes more sense to think about the way in which transitions affect households. So while um, the people we interviewed were clearly experiencing a change which had knock-on impacts um, for aspects of their everyday lives, it also clearly affected the lives of the people they were living with and similarly, if their partner was ill, if their partner lost their job, those things had impacts for them as well. So we need to think about the way in which change ripples through families and the way in which these transitions affect more than just the individual who is living through them. And it's a distinct but I think related point is that consumption behaviours of all sorts aren't simply individual choices but are profoundly affected by the desires, needs, and preferences of household members. And we've got lots of examples of people talking about the arguments, negotiations, compromises they make with their partners, particularly about how they do things, whether they have the energy, whether they have the heating turned on, uh, what they eat, what kind of car they have, how often they use their car, and so on. And this issue about the way in which consumption is negotiated within households is, I think, a really interesting area uh, for further research. The quote at the bottom here is, is a woman who was talking to us and she was a vegetarian and she's talking about the way in which her husband's meat consumption has decreased since he's been uh, living with her. One of the kind of key reasons why it's interesting to look at these sort of transitions isn't just because they um, potentially um, offer a, a point of sort of disruption to routines, but they're also periods, especially things like having a child and retiring when people are likely to be reflecting on their life and thinking about the way they want to live and their hopes um, and fears for the future. And we found this really borne out very strongly in our research. They, these were points of, of a great deal of reflection on identity um, and, and ways in which people wanted to, wanted to live their lives. For the mothers, although other identities remained important, these were largely subsumed by the importance of priority that was ascribed to being a good mother, being a good parent. And many of the mothers talked about how their priorities were, were totally oriented around, around their child. Um, and their decisions about what to do each day were often explained in terms of what was best for the baby. Of course, what's best for the baby can be interpreted very variably, both between people and at different times. So we found people talking about it being best for the baby take the car to the shops because the baby would sleep in the car and its routine would be maintained, while other people, or at other times, people would talk about taking the baby in a buggy because it was better for them to get fresh air or to have an outing. For the retirees as well, it was a time of reflection on identity. Those who had planned and anticipated their retirement were more likely to kind of embrace a new identity that didn't include work, um, whereas those who hadn't chosen to retire were often concerned about the impact of no longer being a valued member of society. And we found that while, when we first interviewed retirees, a lot of them talked about this as being a time for me, had aspirations for global travel, as with this, this, this discourse coexisted with a kind of sense of responsibility um, to other family members. And we often found that by the final interviews, those early aspirations hadn't been realized, but had been subsumed it to responsibilities for care to other members of their family, grandchildren, elderly parents. And that care isn't just a uh, physical thing, but also has kind of financial dimension in terms of uh, providing, um, provi providing support for other family members. So the kind of key point here is about the kind of importance and priority um, that, 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 that rests on family relationships for both of these groups um, at, at these times. For the new parents, it's about creating a new family unit, but often about reinforcing ties to their wider family. And for the retirees, they're navigating their aspirations in the context of a kind of strong sense of responsibility to others. So th these transitions aren't just times of negotiating identity change, but they're times of fundamental changes in resources of time and money. And these are both really strong themes running through the data 
which people often drew on to explain why they had changed things in the directions which they had. So for the mothers, time scarcity was, was a kind of uh, a really kind of common theme. Time was, tr was treated as a kind of really scarce and valued resource, and people were, were constantly thinking about how they could find time to do things. And the two sort of peaks of time scarcity were, were often identified straight after having a baby and when they returned to work, if, if they did that. And the mothers were very concerned with um, the importance of establishing routines um, to, in, order, in order to enable them to do the things they wanted to do. But those routines, again, weren't fixed. It's not simply that people have a baby and they establish a routine, and that's the routine that they live their lives according to. Clearly, routines continue to evolve and change as the child, as the child grows. For the retirees, it was often a sense of needing and wanting to establish a routine to cope with the lack of structure um, w w when they were no longer working. Money, another kind of really critical resource and probably the, the most strongest influencing factor on everyday practice, always talked about as this being the, the key thing which would inform uh, what people did. Um, we, across our sample, we have people of, ver of varying incomes. The mother's incomes varied quite dramatically. All but one of them, though, I think, um, had less money during maternity leave than they had had uh, before, they, before they had their child. And they were all concerned with managing on, on, uh, on restricted resources. And we've got, we've got a quote here from somebody talking about the way in which that sense of coping with restricted resources affects the kind of everyday choices that she would make uh, about what she, what she would buy. For retirees, again, uh, differences in the, in the actual financial resources they had, but regardless, that they, all, they were all adjusting to dealing with less, and many of them, when we first interviewed them, had very little idea of how much they were going to have in retirement, and had a kind of wait-and-see attitude towards it, and were thinking about, and were quite reluctant to kind of make commitments to spend much money until they had kind of worked out how much money they, they actually would have. As a group, we've, uh, there's, we're, kind of, we're used to um, discourses of baby boomers um, as, um, as engaging in unsustainable levels of consumption to the detriment of future generations. And we found that while there were in our data people talking about their aspirations to travel, their aspirations as, about this time for me, these coexisted with really strong discourses of thrift and the need to kind of conserve resources, to, to, not, to, um, not, to not to engage in excessive consumption, um, to avoid waste, um, and, and, and so on. So it, the kind of concern with thrift was a very, very strong theme across both, across both of our groups. And we can talk about that, we'll talk about that a bit later. Um, so I've talked a bit about how shifts in identity and routines and the availability of resources were used to explain any changes that occurred, but clearly, and this is a very obvious point, the available, um, available infrastructures, inv available services, the material reality of everyday life plays a, has a really a shaping role in what people are able to do. This was particularly clear for our sample in, in rural Scotland where they talked a lot about, the, um, about accessibility or difficulty of accessing um, public transport to access services they wanted to. And some people talked about the way in which it was easier to live sustainabl sustainably if you lived in Edinburgh than it was if you lived in, in a rural context in terms of what, what you could actually access. We've got examples of people talking about the way in which sustainable practices happen because there's, because there's infrastructural services there, we recycle because we have to, because the bins are there, um, or because we've got bus passes, and conversely, of people not being able to do things um, because, the, because there's not, the, no, there's not the support for it. But I kind of want to make the point that it's not simply availability or lack of availability um, of infrastructure and services that determines whether or not they're used. And this is clearly the case with public transport, uh, where especially in, in the sample of, of mothers, there was a, there's a kind of strong sense that families have to have cars and that it's difficult taking a baby on a bus. Um, and ideas also about family homes and the, and, and the need for a kind of particular kind of way of living as a family with children inform decisions about whether or not the house you live in uh, is adequate. So we want to think about that kind of interaction between the material context and ideas about appropriate material context. So I'm going to just move on now to talk a little bit about how our participants understood 
the concept of sustainable lifestyles. We didn't talk about this until the very end of the final interviews, by which point we got a really good sense and understanding of our participants' lives, and they appreciated that. What we found when we asked them this question was that over half of our participants equated sustainable lifestyle with maintaining their current status in terms of their health, particularly for the retirees, um, and, um, and having sufficient income uh, for the future. That's not to say that these people didn't understand anything about sustainability, um, or that they weren't engaging in many practices we might see as sustainable, but it does kind of, uh, it does kind of inject another kind of work, uh, note of caution about the language of sustainability, um, and, and it helps us to appreciate that this, this is still a kind of complex and often confusing language. It doesn't necessarily make a great deal of sense to people, at least it doesn't mean what we think it means. Where people were engaging in practices which we might interpret as sustainable, these often weren't explained in terms of environmental values, but by recourse to priorities of thrift, of health, or aspects of care. And the quote here is from a really interesting participant in Scotland who, if you looked at what she was doing, you'd probably think she was the most sustainable participant we had of all. She was very, um, she tried to avoid buying things whenever she could. She always bought second-hand things. She was very concerned with conserving energy. She was trying to get planning permission to build an eco-house. But she was very clear that none of it was done for environmental reasons. That wasn't her priority at all. It was about saving money, about getting best value for money. Just um, to conclude this little bit, um, and focusing particularly on some of the, the new mothers who, um, so at the beginning, talked in a way that was kind of identifiably expressing environmental values, Towards the end of the process, many of them were talking about how their kind of interest or engagement with environmental issues had kind of um, had had declined since they'd had their baby, and this was explained in, in terms both of then the kind of orientation around the baby and also the scarcity of time, less time to read papers, less time to listen to the news, an idea that environmental issues and interest in environmental issues was kind of squeezed out by the priorities that they had at that time. And some of them talked about the way in which they would love, in theory, to live more sustainably, sustainably, but talked about this as something which was kind of at odds with the reality of everyday life. So this quote, um, she says, in my little ideal head, I'd quite like to go and live in some nice green little commune. Not commune, but you know what I mean, solar panels, a sustainable lifestyle. But I think we're probably less sustainable, realistically. We eat less organic fruit and veg because we can't afford it. We do use the car. If you want to go and see people for two hours to do it by public transport, it becomes a pain. Disposable nappies aren't sustainable by any stretch of the imagination. We use the washing machine more. I don't like a lot of my choices, but I find it's just a reality of life. So she, this account's a really nice kind of um, quote in which she's talking about how the realities of restricted finances, of time scarcity, and the need, perceived need for convenience outweigh any kind of ideal choices that she might make. I'm going to hand over now to Begita who's going to talk a little bit about some of our quantitative data about reported lifestyle and behaviour change. Right, I have got a microphone, so I hope people can hear me. I'll stay here. Uh, so I've got three slides, so I won't take too much time, and I'll hand back to uh, Kate. Um, so one of the things we wanted to do was to see if we can quantify, if there's any way we can quantify some of the changes that people talked about. So uh, we uh, distributed a survey among all the parents and also um, the participants of the survey and also their, par um, their partners um, uh, before and uh, at the end of the study. And uh, I've just pull I'm just pulling out some of the findings of that. The, they were asked a huge number of questions, but these are just some of the findings. So one of the things we asked them was how much time they spent on various activities at the start and at the end of the project. Uh, and basically what we found is that was on average, as you can see from these graphs, not surprisingly, uh, retirees spend more time on leisure activities at the end of the project than they did at the start, and this, uh, the reverse was true for, uh, for new parents. Um, that's perhaps not surprisingly. What was interesting, though, was that a lot of things didn't necessarily change. But one of the things we also found was that both groups said they spent more time on things like cooking, washing, and shopping, and going for walks, uh, so walking. Uh, interestingly, also, they uh, all said they spent more time on shopping than they expected, so that, or maybe hoped, um, at the start of the project, and they also spent less time walking than they expected or hoped at the start of the project. 
Now, one of the things to point about this is that there is a big difference between the reasons why they both, those both groups spend more time cooking and washing. So just looking at the changes in behaviors might not be necessarily so meaningful. So obviously, uh, retirees spend more time cooking uh, because some of the things that came out of the interviews as well is that they, they like cooking more, they spend more time uh, cooking exotic foods and things like that, whereas, of course, parents spend more time uh, cooking for their children, for their newborn babies. Uh, and similar for, for, for uh, shopping, for instance, uh, a lot of the retirees talked about spending more time talking, talk, uh, shopping, going shopping every day, going for a walk to the shops, the local shops and things like that, whereas for parents, again, there was very different motivations for doing these things. I don't know why people spend more time washing both groups, and, but that might just be uh, because, um, I don't know, time of the year? No idea. Um, we also asked them specifically questions about their uh, self-reported pro-environmental behavior. So there was a whole list of behaviors, and on average, across all these behaviors, uh, what we found was that uh, retirees said they uh, performed a bit more pro-environmental behavior at the end of the project than they did at the start. Um, whereas for parents that more or less stayed the same, if, or it declined a little bit. Uh, so that's on average. But there were lots of differences between different types of behavior. So the biggest things that stood out really was that um, retirees, for instance, spend more time composting, uh, whereas um, parents did that less, uh, which might be related to some of the things I talked about in the interviews, for instance, that they spend more time in the garden. Uh, we also found that uh, retirees spend um, uh, are more likely uh, to say that they would uh, put on a jumper and not turn the heating up, whereas this, the reverse is true for parents, for instance, that might be related to finances, for instance. Um, whereas orga eating more organic food, we found exactly the opposite. So parents were much more likely to say that they would eat more organic food. And um, Kate has already talked a bit about um, being a good parent, and that was very much part of this, being a good parent, feeding your child uh, the right sort of things. And um, Kate put a nice, gave me, Sue gave me a nice quote here from one of the mothers, for instance, who said, um, and the feeding, oh my Lord, I don't understand. You would eat in a restaurant and nobody would come up to you and judge you. But when you have a child, all of a sudden, the whole world can tell you what you're doing is right or wrong. It could almost feel, the I could almost feel the judgment. So Feeding your child the right thing is really, really important. And of course, um, infant food industry plays, really plays into this as well. And that's something that maybe was reflected here uh, as well. One of the things clearly what we found was that the motivations for uh, these behaviors, so we found changes, significant changes in behavior, but the motivations for these behaviors, uh, you can't really pull out of quantitative data like this, and that, that comes out very much of the qualitative data, and they are not necessarily environmental. So that comes across in this, for instance, as well. We asked uh, all the uh, respondents whether they thought they had made a change that was good for the environment, and whether they thought they had made a change since the start of the project that was bad for the environment. So 45% of the people said that they had made a change uh, that was beneficial for the environment, that were mostly retirees, which reflects what we saw before. Uh, and uh, most, most common behaviors were recycling and more walking and also more organic food. And some people also talked about washing more, actually not less, but more washing more uh, with less harmful detergents or in lower temperatures. Well, when you look at the triggers, uh, actually nobody talked about the environment. So the triggers for this were convenience and economic or health reasons. Uh, they also, uh, when we asked them whether they did anything that was bad for the environment, about a third said that they did. Um, and uh, particularly these were parents. So again, this reflects what we saw before. Uh, more heating, more bathing, more washing, more fuel use, more food waste, and of course, nappies. And the trigger for that was mostly just having the child. So one of the things that also is reflected in this slide, I think, is that people do seem to be aware of the things that they do that are good and bad for the environment, but actually that doesn't necessarily relate to acting more pro-environmental, if you like. The motivations for doing the things that are good for the environment or bad for the environment uh, are clearly very, very different. And I think that's one of the, the good things about a project like this. You can unravel those motives and find out how things change as well as why they might change. Hand back to Kate. <laughs>
Okay, so just to, just to conclude, I mean, the first thing I want to say is that obviously all transitions are not the same. Baz talked about moving house. We've talked about having a first child and retiring. And the point really is that if we're going to talk about these transitions as opportunities for intervention sustainability, we need to think very carefully about the lived reality of those experiences and the particular kinds of priorities and pressures that people have um, over those periods. And we've talk, we talked through six um, kind of important um, observations about transitions, which I hope kind of inform a discussion that we can have about the, the potential of these times, um, you know, for, for um, interventions to encourage sustainable living. The first one, processes of ongoing change. I forgot to say that it's not only parents for whom adjustment is something which is ongoing, but also for retirees as well. Retirement is increasingly a kind of long process of adjustment with the retirement age increasing, uh, people over the age of 65 being encouraged to continue to work. And many of the people in our sample hadn't retired by the second interview, even though they anticipated that they would, um, and, and hadn't begun to feel they'd adjusted to retirement until the, until the final interview. So that too is a kind of ongoing process of, of change. Transitions are often experienced in multiple. It's hard to disentangle the effects of one particular transition. They're not just individual events, but they affect people around them. They are a time of reflection on new identities and priorities, and we really need to kind of keep an eye on what those, what those priorities are. Changing resources of time and money and the material context are really critical in, form in informing what people are able to do and what they're going to want to do. So I want to kind of make a kind of provocative conclusion, which is that in some ways these particular transitions we've looked at might be really bad times for interventions specifically about sustainable living. We're thinking about the kind of priorities that people have at these times uh, and uh, which, which are informing the changes which they're making. And it seems that these are not going to be particularly good times to try to squeeze sustainability in as well. But that's not to say that there is no kind of hope, but I think that the, uh, that the point we want to finish with really is that any initiatives need to work with the grain of existing priorities and existing pressures that people have at these times rather than trying to find a space for some extra sustainability. Excellent, thank you very much, uh, Kate, Sue, Bagita, and Bass. We've had two fascinating presentations about two quite complex projects, related projects as it turns out, but with different methodologies. Assessing transitions over time, looking at the change processes themselves, assessing whether there is some possibly unique opportunity there to uh, get people not just to reflect on their priorities, but actually to change their behaviours and practices. A finding from the quantitative study that Bass described that actually there may just be such a narrow window of opportunity and a lot of findings from the qualitative study about the messiness of the change process itself.